thank you for joining us for the press seminar today, both in person and those people via Facebook. I'm really pleased to welcome here today Mark Ashworth and Ria Kordovitz. And they're going to present their work today on the development of Cyclops, or the Psychological Outcomes Profiles, capturing a patient's story with Cyclops, a client-generated, individualised outcome measure. Maria and Mark are based at the School of Population Health and Environmental Sciences at King's College London. Maria is a Chartered Psychologist, Health Services Researcher and MSc Programme Lead, and Mark is a Reader in Primary Care. In addition, Mark has worked as a GP in a deprived community in Inner London for 30 years. Maria has spent over a decade managing NHS programmes, projects and services, and carrying out independent organisational development, management and research consultancy work. With regards to their psychometric research interests, Maria is part of the KCL development team of the Idiographic Patient Mental Health Outcome Measure that they're here to talk about today. Mark chaired the team of psychologists, counsellors, psychotherapists and GPs which produced Cyclops. Beyond that, Maria's research interests concern mental health and the governance and policy of new health and social care organisation reforms. Mark's research interests also cover the relationship between physical and mental health, health inequalities and multimorbidity. So thank you very much for joining us today. Emery, thank you very much for the introduction. Well, it really is a great pleasure being here. In fact, it was a moment of discovery, a moment of self-discovery coming here. I can't believe what a beautiful place you have, a beautiful institution, and thank you very much for a beautiful invitation. Um, I'm going to start off by telling you a story. And all stories begin with the beginning. So in the beginning, Cyclops. I chaired a primary care mental health research group back in 1999, and it consisted of a range of primary care academics, all with an interest in mental health issues. Um, we're all interested in research, and the mood of the group was frankly a pretty disgruntled mood. It was disgruntled because people knew, or at least said that they knew, that they were doing a great job, but when it came to proving that they were doing a great job, they were struggling because the measures that were given at the time to measure outcomes after talking therapy seemed to show that not much was happening. There wasn't much shift, there wasn't much evidence of improvement, and yet here were talking therapists with tales of real changes in people's lives, improvement that had been made that somehow wasn't being captured by the instruments. In fact, they felt the instruments had a political dimension, that they were imposed, they were imposed by the health service managers as possibly a justification for cuts in the service or turn that round the other way. If they didn't show good enough improvement, well certainly at that point there would be some cuts to come. So, how do you capture success? That was a challenge they put to this group. So we went right back to the theory of mental health outcome measures. They didn't like what they got, they wanted something new. What new could we offer? And we went into the theory, and the theory is all about nomothetic and ideographic measures. Now, I hope I'm not losing you at this point, because it's a really important distinction. The standard measures which give you a score to standard questions. You're probably familiar with all those outcome measures. There's the PHQ-9, the HADS, depression, the HADS anxiety score, the GHQ, and so the list goes on. Um, core was a very important part of our collaboration, clinical outcomes routine evaluation. And they asked standard questions. We wanted to start with a clean slate and say to the patient, to the client, what's the thing that's most important for you. And hey, why don't we measure that thing rather than us having some predetermined, pre-imposed questions almost. Well, they felt, the therapist felt that the questionnaires were imposed and there's a sense in which that transmits down the line and patients may feel that those questions are imposed and some of them not have any personal relevance or significance to the individual. So we wanted to reverse it. What happens if you measure those things that patients themselves say, say are important? That was our starting point. So we went into the theory, and the theory, frankly, was a bit mixed. What we learned was we were very definitely on the right-hand side of that chart. Not far right, but definitely on the right-hand side of the chart. We wanted to do something which was pretty freestyle, pretty individualised, rather than the standardised instruments. 
And the trouble with anything individualized is you really can't make much sense of the baseline. Because if I do a baseline on you, the thing that's being measured is individual to you. It means nothing in population terms. If I do a baseline of a standardized instrument, well, that has been validated on a standardized population. And you can get a baseline that really means something in terms of how near the norm you are, or have you crossed the point into caseness. So it helps you form diagnostic thresholds. You cannot do that when you ask the patient what's the thing that troubles you most. But it has one very key feature, and it's the very key feature that the therapist is looking for, and that is responsiveness to change. So the responsiveness to change, if you measure that thing of most importance to the patient, is much greater than if you give them 20 questions which may or may not have personal meaning, personal significance, to the patient stroke client. And because I come from a medical background, forgive me if I refer to patients rather than clients. If I'm in a sociology audience, I get lynched for that and I have to refer to clients. And I tend to be a bit sort of in between. So I will flip-flop between the two terms. Forgive me. Um, there's another problem with these measures. Look at the bottom bit. Feasibility. Not great for these uh, these individualised measures because somebody's got to administer them. They're a bit more complex. It's not just a tick box. How do you overcome all those limitations? Back in 1999, we devised this measure called Cyclox, Psychological Outcome Profiles. Great catchy name, actually. Uh, we launched a competition. Email did exist back in 1999. We spread the email around far and wide, and a bottle of champagne and a bottle of extra virgin oil was offered to the person who'd come up with the best acronym. Cyclops won. I handed over the two bottles, and Cyclops, as a name, has stuck ever since. Nice catchy name. And what you do on Cyclops is you ask the patient to define their main problem. We were also quite keen on that, believe it or not, back in 1999, was state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, desktop design technology. It looks okay and perhaps a bit brighter than some of the other examples, but it's not exactly the hippest of formats, and we're working on a new electronic format now. But my goodness, the information governance constraints on anything electronic, where data is stored, where personal data is stored, are incredibly difficult to work with, and we're getting there. Um, but it's not easy, so we will have another new format. That's the format we're in at the moment. That's the format that you will see on our website. And it is basically three questions. You can see, you won't be able to see the text there, but you can see the boxes there. And the three boxes are the unique feature cyclops. They're the three free text boxes in which you ask, box number one, what is the problem that troubles you most? Please write it in the box below and then score it. <coughs> Number two, is there another problem? If so, please write it in the box below and score it. So there's two problem questions, and I want you kind of to get what the sequence is. Four questions altogether. P1, problem one, is that first free text box. Problem two, P2, is that second free text box. The third free, pe free text box is a function box, F1 we call it. And that asks you the question, what is the thing that you have trouble doing as a result of your problem. So people write down in what way they are functionally impaired. They don't ask the question functional impairment. What do you find difficult to do as a result of your problem? And then score that too. So that's three free text boxes, three questions, two on problems, one on functioning. So what's the fourth question? This is where we call ourselves a hybrid measure because we've gone back to a standardised question. We couldn't quite capture that as an ideographic patient-generated question. And the standardised question simply asks, how have you felt in yourself in the last week? It's a well-being question. So you've got the format. Two problem questions, one function question, one well-being question. The last one is standardised. Yeah, that is our instrument. And we have got a during therapy, because things change during therapy. There's an extra box on there. That hasn't got three boxes, it's got four boxes. And that is because you're allowed to develop new problems during the course of therapy and score those. New problems might emerge. Maria's going to be talking more about those. Those emerged on that form there. And then finally, there's the all-important post-therapy form. And this captures where you are at with your same problem 
that you recorded right at the beginning before you started therapy. This is the problem that you mentioned when you first started therapy. How do you score it now? And the same for problem two, and the same for the function thing. How do you score it now? And if any new problems ca came up during the course of therapy, how do you score those? So, the psychometric properties, I think, that I've displayed on that slide should by now be fairly self-evident to you. We've got a baseline score which is weak at discriminating caseness from non-caseness, a change score, high responsiveness, qualitative data, well, people write interesting things in those free text boxes. The baseline score is not standardised. To our surprise, it did correlate with standardised measures. And I want to show you a graph which just shows the kind of correlation. And I presented this so far as though this is two completely different schools of thought, the standardised instruments and the patient-generated instruments. Actually, the scores that you derive from the two instruments are, at baseline, pretty similar. The change scores are pretty different. But I'll show you how similar they are. There is a graph showing the base baseline score of cyclops on the x-axis, and in this case, core outcome measure on the y-axis. And there's a few cases where there's some outliers, but in general, there's a pretty strong correlation. R0.65 in terms of the correlation coefficient. And I've written there an outlier, and that particular outlier could have gone the other side of the line, but on that side of the line, an outlier means you're scoring higher on the cyclops at baseline um, than you are uh, in the core measure, and vice versa if you're the other side of the line. So what about the all-important change score? The change score proved, once we tested this, it fulfilled the expectations in terms of responsiveness to change. It was indeed measuring those items of personal significance. So I'm going to show you the effect sizes in the next slide. And by effect sizes, so here we are. Remember the problem we had right at the beginning, the therapist saying that somehow the improvement they could see happening before their eyes was not being captured by the instruments. So the all-important thing becomes a figure. What is that change score? How do you measure change? You measure change with the effect size. The effect size is the change, the difference between pre and post, divided by the standard deviation of the baseline. So anything greater than about 0.8 in health service research is pretty good. You're kind of looking at 0.8 and a bit bigger. That's what you're hoping for. I'll show you what we got. That's what we got. In our first study, about 120 cases, we got a change score of 1.53 and core was a change score, that's the effect size, of 1.05. Um, treble asterisks, which I've stuck on there to show how significant it was, all the P less than 0.001 and all that. It was just as we thought, it was showing change to a greater extent than the change showed on core. And similarly, we did a comparison with HADS, Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. And this was a larger study. Again, we found that larger effect size. What about what people were writing in the free text boxes? I'm not going to talk too much about this because this is the size, the aspect that Maria is going to talk about. The qualitative analysis, but you saw that there were three free text boxes. And it was very interesting because not only were people telling you about those things that were most important to them, but fairly soon we spotted that a lot of those things that were most important to them were not things that were in the standardised measure. In other words, ask the patient what they wanted to measure, and it wasn't what CORE or HADS was measuring. In fact, the overlap, if you kind of think of it as a Venn diagram, wasn't very good at all. And we found, doing a thematic analysis, 44% of the themes uh, in Cyclops were not featured in core. 60% of all the patients mentioned something, one of those free text boxes, that was not captured by the 34 questions in core. So we're kind of, not just a different approach, but measuring 
somewhat different concepts, at least in terms of what the patient was reporting. And what were those new things that patients were reporting in their cyclops? These are the kind of things that were not appearing in the standardised questions, and it kind of makes sense. This was, the context was primary care talking therapy. This is secondary care, this is out in the community, this is psychologists, um, cognitive analy analytic therapists, counselling psychologists, clinical psychologists, all working in community settings. Some linked to a general practice, some definitely not linked to a general practice. None of them private. And it hardly, it's hardly surprising that the key issues mentioned by patients were relationship problems, were difficulties socialising, were sexual difficulties. Those three don't appear on most standardised instruments. Now, another study we did, a very large study, the Upbeat study, was looking at patients and GP registers. So now we're going to shift our attention to general practice. And general practice is very good at keeping lists of people with long-term conditions. And a whole host of practices in South London were recruited to this study, the Upbeat study, uh, in patients with coronary heart disease, what interventions are successful at, at working with people with depression coexisting with their CHD. That was the background of the study. And using Cyclops, what sort of things did that client group, a very selective client group, and you can imagine an older client group, but they weren't necessarily seeking counselling, not at all. This was a group chosen because they had a physical long-term condition. What did they say were their main issues? Well, they have just had a heart attack, so I'm not surprised. Quite a few said physical health was a big, big issue, but an awful lot said social. Um, psychological, everybody in the study was surprised at the low rate. Cyclops picked up a low rate of psychological issues. Actually, all the formal depression assessments, the PADS depression scale, found pretty low rates, lower than expected in the CHD group. And it looked like they'd really, this wasn't the usual secondary care sample of people with CHD, this was a primary care sample. And maybe they kind of got back to everyday living and had come to terms with a heart attack that nearly, presumably, it could have taken their life. They'd come to terms with it, they rebuilt life, and they'd established, yes, I've got this long-term condition, but I've moved on. So physical health was a big issue. And what we then did was we used the Cyclops categorization to, to, to subdivide the sample according to what they put on their Cyclops um, free text boxes. So normally when you do a depression study and look at the hospital anxiety depression scale, you just get one global score for your whole population. With Cyclops, we were able to subdivide it into those who said their main problem was physical cardiac, those who said their main problem was physical non-cardiac, so people who were still worried about their chest pain, their main problem was chest pain, they had a much higher HAD score, and high means more anxiety, uh, in this case it's anxiety, not the depression rating, higher anxiety ratings. If their main problem was physical but it wasn't cardiac, they got much lower anxiety ratings. And rather than me go through every single one of the, um, every one of those, those domains on that graph, you get the general idea that actually you can subdivide your population and track them and see what their baseline, baseline scores are and then see what their recovery scores are. Now, I want to completely change the subject of how Cyclops has developed from its beginnings as something which was, okay, it's patient-generated, it's patient-focused, we can be very right on and say it's very patient-friendly. Actually, if you heard the beginning of the story, it was designed as something that was therapist-friendly. So the prime driver was something therapist-friendly, but also, we hope, into the bargain, it was something that was very patient-friendly. Cyclops has been picked up by WHO. WHO were looking for an instrument 
that measured change in developing countries in conflict zones. This is way out of the comfort zone for Cyclops. This is not what it was designed for at all, but WHO wanted to look at problems and they are very averse to anything which has, in, in any sense, transmits a Western culture to developing countries. And they deemed Cyclops to be the most culturally neutral of the Western mental health outcome measures. And they were very keen to use it in one of their problem interventions. They get um, semi-literate, uh, tr trained lay workers to administer a program that they run. You can see the countries they're currently running it in. Um, and they administer their program called PM Plus, Problem Management Plus. You go on and you simply go on Google and go WHO Problem Management Plus, and up comes a torrent of all the WHO literature. WHO are very good at literature. WHO actually are very good at publications, which has been great for Cyclops, because they just churn out the publications, each of them in top rated journals, and it gets quite a lot of airspace. He saw the problems that people were reporting in a London primary care urban setting. What do people report on Cyclops in Kenya? Well, there's going to be a lot of detailed analysis on this because there is somebody at WHO who is doing their PhD on a qualitative interpretation of what people are saying. But at its simplest, this is not a detailed, I don't need the qualitative stuff, I think, to Maria coming after me. But and from a simplistic uh, analysis of what people are saying, actually, you can kind of identify with what the women in Kenya are saying. You can kind of identify with what people in Pakistan are saying. And interesting, again, I say, uh, just to lead into what Maria's going to be talking about, look how physical and non-psychological the problems are reported in Pakistan. Is that because they can't talk about that sort of thing when they're asked to write what's the problem that troubles you most unprompted and unanalyzed statement of their own problem. And that is the Problem Management Plus um, program. There's, th again, just as when it was used in the setting where it was originally designed, the change scores have been substantial, the change scores have generally been larger than the standardised instruments. And that slide, I'm sorry, is out of date because in in 2016, December 2016, that was first published, and since then, there's been the torrent of publications. So, to conclude, Cyclops has fulfilled that expectation of being a sensitive measure of change. And I'm talking about the quantitative side, I'm talking about the scores. Nothing to do with what people write in the free text boxes. When it's, when it's quantitative, they are scoring that thing that they themselves wrote was the problem that troubled the most. But when you use those scores, those scores are a highly sensitive measure of change. So if you want to show that the talking therapy is working, well, Cyclops offers you one way of demonstrating change following a psychotherapeutic intervention. I really want to emphasise point number two. It's a complement to standardised measures. It very much, if it's used on its own, if it's used in competition with standardised instruments, true, you saw my earlier slide, I'm saying that standardised instruments are missing things that are captured by Cyclops. But on the other hand, unless you've got some population norms, unless you've got some diagnostic thresholds, you don't know what the psychological profile is of the client group that you're working with. Are they all very depressed? Or actually, are they not depressed at all? You kind of need to know that basic, those basic facts about your client group. Cultural neutrality, we've covered that. If, if you like, that was always a spin-off product of the instrument. We were not expecting it to go in the direction of WHO. We absolutely didn't market it in the direction of WHO. And interestingly, they, if there had been any marketing, they would not have used it because they're very averse to lobbying. Because it then appears that they have been, there's been a process of lobbying. Yes, they finally capitulated. They needed to make their choice independently. 
a rich source of qualitative insight. That's my final conclusion. I'm not, we are presenting ourselves today as a bit of a double act. I'm the numbers person, Maria's the narrative person. I'm not blind myself to the narrative, nor is Maria blind to the numbers. Uh, we have considerable overlap, but I've been really taken by the richness of the quality of data and the power of some of the things that patients themselves are writing in those boxes. Not always like that, I admit there's a few one-liners in those boxes, but sometimes a life history just pours out in a torrent in a tiny box. When we get an electronic version, we can expand that tiny box. But Maria is going to tell you about the qualitative side, what's in the boxes, and much more. Maria. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I get you set up? That's OK. I'll You're there. Ahead. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Mark. So, yes, I hope to convey some of those client stories and the richness that Mark alluded to. So, the aim of my slightly shorter presentation is to present selected research which explores the utility of the free text responses within Cyclops for both the client, you can see the psychological language there, Mark, not the patient, the client, and also for the practitioner. Um, and I should just say, as an aside, that we're actually um, developing feedback-informed therapy tools using Cyclops, so toolkits, online toolkits, which will actually help to create feedback. Um, I hate to use the word performance, but on the therapist's, if you like, efficacy of working um, with their clients. So I'm focusing on this free text response within Cyclops. I just wanted to revisit the Cyclops' origins. Um, so Mark touched upon what was, at the time, a reaction to the policy backdrop, which really started around the time of Thatcher in the late 70s and early 80s, where we saw this proliferation of targets and standardised measures being introduced into the public sector, but specifically in the healthcare sector, there was a feeling that perhaps there's somewhat a mismatch in the way we're looking at health and the very complexity of it, particularly when it comes to mental health. Some of you may have been around for the introductions on the new labour of um, IAPT, um, the, the Access to Psychological Therapies, what's the I said? Increasing. Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies. And again, that with it led to um, a move towards standardisation, towards tracking the performance um, of therapists. And it was felt that some of this might have been somewhat short-sighted um, in the types of information capture tools that were being used. So really, this is a response to a policy backdrop of what was coined as, um, by Bevan and Hood as targets and terror. And if you haven't read this paper, I really suggest it. It was quite a seminal paper. It came out in 2006, um, which argued that public sector professionals were under increasing surveillance from the top down, and what that actually meant for true performance. However, Cyclops was developed not only as a reaction to this, but also as an understanding that there is some utility in information capture, and really attempted to, I think, straddle both worlds, wouldn't you say, Mark? So both the quantitative and qualitative. And also thinking about resource consideration. So increasingly, therapists have more and more pressures to deal with patients in a very time-bound type of framework. So CBT-based approaches came in, solution-focused approaches became more popular. So typically, I believe on the NHS, you're sort of limited to between 5 to 20 sessions, but um, typically a patient will receive under 10. And something about using Cyclops to identify a problem to focus on from the outset um, was where its utility was um, recognised in its design. And I keep using the word therapist, but Cyclops is designed to be used across therapeutic settings. And really, it's a very kind of loose idea of who the therapist could be. It could be psychologists such as yourselves, um, mental health workers. It could even be GPs um, with some uh, skill set in the kind of mental health approaches. 
so this paper here, I don't know if you could see that, um, but it was investigating the qualitative and quantitative validity of Cyclops um, in 2012. And I wanted to just uh, cite this conclusion, which is that Cyclops, so we can think of it as very much against this backdrop of targets and terror, providing a much needed patient voice to research and clinical outcome measures. Um, and therefore, it made a really important contribution um, to the development of person-centered medicine. So I'm going to talk about two studies, a real overview, um, but this one was authored um, by the late Susan Robinson, and actually kind of authored by uh, Chris Evans, who uh, we're lucky to have in the audience today. This looked at um, a sample of 235 patients within a primary care setting who were in touch with some sort of therapist, mainly psychologists, either clinical or counselling or uh, mental health workers, and um, the team here, the research team, used the narrative-based approach to learn about the types of responses that were given in the free text boxes. So they came up with a classification framework of the problems, so the boxes at the start um, of the questionnaire, and the consequence. Now this table is somewhat misleading because it, I don't mean that these are the consequences of these types of problems. Um, rather, these are two separate classifications. Um, and as you can see thematically, in terms of problems, Susan and her team uh, came up with seven areas um, and six areas of consequence. And I would argue that those could give a therapist a really nice, if you like, understanding of the types of problems that they may face in primary care and help them develop suitable strategies and toolkits for working with clients around those certain problems. And also, you know, very salient as well for the client, wouldn't you say? I don't know um, if, if you think about your own clinical experience. Some of these are, are things that you know, are rather rich for working with in practice, and, and Cyclops helps to reveal that. So the conclusion of the authors here was that Cyclops provides us with a rich diversity of narratives, and these represent clients' voices that frame problems with the personal and social context in which they are experienced. And of course, you know, we all work within a biopsychosocial uh, framework, so this is... Um, something that's underlined here, it helps to reveal the personal and social world. So the second study I wanted to mention had a similar size sample. So again in primary care, uh, this took place in Toruń in Poland. And um, I've got the pictures here because Toruń is famed for its delicious gingerbreads, uh, but also is the a birthplace of this guy, any idea who this is? <laughs> no. So Renaissance, Reformation, Earth no longer the centre of the universe. Copernicus. That's it, yes. Nicolaus Copernicus. None of that is, of course, relevant to the study, but I'm just sort of flying the flag for Poland. You may have noticed I've got a Polish surname to give you a real feel um, of the kind of social context within which this study took place. So what we discovered with a group um, of clients responding on Cyclops is that one group specifically presented with somatic problems when they completed their first Cyclops questionnaire. But as the very brief, very solution-focused CBT-informed uh, type of therapy in which GPs that they were seeing were trained, as that therapy took place, their problems began to then somehow adapt and change, and they were followed by in-therapy problems which were interpersonal in nature. Now, I'm slightly embarrassed because this is such a lovely study and it still hasn't been published, but um, watch this space. I might finally, after years and years, get it out there. Um, so these are the examples of somatic problems that clients uh, initially presented with, just to give you an idea of the types of things, issues that patients highlight on the Cyclops questionnaire. So this was the group that presented in a very somatic way. Now I should note that this was 
a rather laborious process of translating by myself and also blind translation by a GP in Poland of um, all of those 240 or so responses into English and then almost an interator type process where we'd reach a, a, an agreement on our translation. So we we're quite rigorous um, linguistically, if you like. So these are the somatic problems. But in the course of therapy, which I believe was um, on average lasted three sessions, we saw these types of <coughs> issues being revealed. And look at the richness there. So my husband was accused of corruption at work and there probably will be a court case. Fights with my husband at home about coming home late, missing savings. Quite a lot of richness there. A lot of interpersonal issues which were revealed. And wouldn't you say quite fertile ground for a therapist working in a psychological and social framework to actually do some good with the client or at least explore some of these issues and we're really interested in how soon these actually became revealed. I mean it may not be a surprise because these patients were seeing GPs in the first instance so I suppose culturally the expectation would be to talk about their physical problems but as soon as this kind of CBT based approach began and Cyclops helped them to elicit some of these things it really can be quite powerful in terms of capture of patient or client stories. But of course there are limitations as with um, anything and you know we're not just here to promote Cyclops, uh, well we are but um, you know let's be aware of some of the constraints. So there are some methodological considerations um, from a qualitative standpoint. So you may have spotted that a lot of the analysis that we've done um, could be termed uh, as content analysis. So in essence, we're counting how often things occur. And that's slightly paradoxical because you could argue that that's quite nomothetic in nature. So we're looking at similarities across the population. Um, so perhaps when it comes to the qualitative side, Cyclops doesn't always lend itself so well to purist qualitative methodologies. And we're having to apply methodologies which sit somewhere between the ideographic and the nomothetic in order to capture, um, if you like, just the amount of responses that, um, that we get. So qualitative purists may be somewhat cynical, although I'm one of them in, in some cases. And, um, you know, I'm... Uh, kind of really surprised at how rich some of this information and how therapeutically useful it can actually be. Completion fatigue as well, uh, as with any form of questionnaire, especially one where you're asked for free text responses, people tend to, you know, feel rather annoyed by it and give very brief answers. Um, but nevertheless, even some of those somatic problems that were talked about initially by the patients in Poland, they were very brief and yet still gave scope um, to interact therapeutically um, with that client. Cyclops isn't designed as a diagnostic instrument. I mean, not so much a limitation. It, it wasn't its original intention to be one, um, but it doesn't have that diagnostic utility. And some might argue that it is an oversimplification. Um, it does capture stories um, in a very short and very brief way. And, you know, that scoring with certain um, schools of thought when it comes to psychotherapy, especially to so say the psychodynamic uh, approaches, it might not sit well because it doesn't appear to bring with it that level of maybe intellectual complexity, perhaps, or, or that psychotherapeutic process. Um, but nonetheless, perhaps even with those types of approaches, it gives a client a useful starting point. So clients who may not be psychologically aware or, you know, kind of lack insight into this more yeah, psychological way of thinking, um, to be able to define a problem from an outset and score it could um, sit better with, with certain types of clients, even uh, with those um, kind of more psychodynamic schools of thought. 
So, um, take home messages. So, to sum up, uh, and I suppose I'm I reiterating and emphasising a lot of what Mark said. So, short problem descriptions may well facilitate therapeutic interaction and focus. Cyclops may be particularly appropriate for use in time bound clinical or therapeutic practice. It enables the client to rate their problems with potential to capture change over time, as Mark demonstrated. But it also enables a change in the client's most troubling problems to be explored and helps the therapist to see any change along the journey. Thus, we hope that Cyclops promotes person-centeredness and we hope it does so within a kind of ever-enduring target-driven policy context. And lastly, even a word can tell a story. And I don't think that we as practitioners, I mean, I'm no longer one, but I, I don't feel we should underestimate the power, power of words and, and brief sentences in, in driving our interactions with our clients. So, <laughs> I needed to put this embarrassing photo up. Here is me with some bespectacled men on our roof terrace. <laughs> Um, at Addison's house and the guys campus at King's, that's the Cyclops team. Here are our contact details and that's the website. Now I did just very briefly want to actually show you um, our website. If you haven't yet had a look, I don't think you mentioned Mark that um, Cyclops is freely available. So it's free to download, there's no payment, no subscription and it's available here. And I'm showing this because we've had quite a lot of input into this beautiful slickery design of our website that's taken quite a few months um, to launch. Uh, and we're very proud of it. So you can see that this is uh, the standard Cyclops. And we've also developed a Cyclops kid version. We worked with experts um, in uh, pediatric psychology to help develop that. There's a Cyclops team as well. And we also have seen, as, as Mark said, Cyclops being used globally. So here are um, some of our translated versions uh, of Cyclops. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria and Mark, for this absolutely fabulous, fantastic, stimulating, rich presentation that I think is going to inspire us a lot here and matches so much of what we're doing at Crest, mm. uh, what we're interested in, what you know, we stand for at Crest as well. So um, really great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. We're going now to do some sort of questions and answers, and that's when we say goodbye to our Facebook audience. Thank you very much.